Everybody, it's Tyler here at the Championships, checking in team number 696 Circuit Breakers to help me speak more about this fantastic robot. By the way, I have Dino, Jeffrey, and Hunter. And Circuit Breakers, uh, I've really noticed this robot this year. We saw them on Clips of the Week a few weeks ago where they have a wicked fast climb and it's really cool. Uh, but this robot is truly a complete package. We'll talk about some of their manufacturing process, follow that full cargo journey, the climber and some programming coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. Your destination for first content, updates, and gaming. Welcome, Welcome to the fun. First updates now, supported by Striker Careers. First alumni and mentors are making Striker a top priority for their internships and careers. That's because Striker knows that those in first are the leaders and innovators of tomorrow. If you want to help make the world a better place by creating life saving medical devices and technology, get started at careers.stryker.com. So let's talk about manufacturing process a little bit, Jeffrey. Uh, talk to me about uh, how your team approaches it. I know we got a couple of props to show off as well. So the way our team works, we have a we have a design team and a, and a manufacturing team. So when the design team okay's parts to be made, we'll uh, on the manufacturing team we'll, for example, take the models of these parts and we program them and run them on in house on our CNC mill machines. Same with our CNC lathes and our laser cutters. And so this, for example, just one part, the store-bought plastic version wasn't strong enough, so we just made our own metal ones. So as yeah. you're approaching a, a, on this robot here, and we'll talk about each area a bit more, but like, uh, what, like what methods do you use to manufacture some of this? Is this all done in-house, that sort of thing? Yeah, so basically all this was done in-house. We have a lot of what you'll see is these pocketed box tubes. We have a four-axis fiber laser. So we're able to put these long box tubes in a rotary chuck in there, and it'll laser cut all these holes. And you know this tube takes 40, 45 minutes to make. Sure. So it's extremely fast, and it's one of the most used machines that, that we have. Very aesthetically pleasing too. So yeah. absolutely. Let's uh, let's follow that cargo path going through here. So talk to me about uh, your intake. You have a very compliant intake, right? So I'd love to hear more about that design process. Uh, what worked? What didn't work? And any iterations you might have made throughout the season? So we made a few iterations. We started out with not a four ball or a four bar intake. We had one that just flopped out over, sure. but it just it wasn't compliant. So we redesigned for this, and then we've made a few tweaks to the geometry to to change the ball compression and make sure that we can really pick the balls up easily. Same with the bumper material. We've worked to make the parts stronger so that they don't break. And it's been fairly reliable. We haven't really broken it much since we've made those changes. So as we keep following uh, on here, so so right now this is just just coming down right over the bumper, right? And then we're going into here. I'd love to hear more about uh, the material that you're using because you got a couple of different unique type of materials as you go and kind of into like your indexer and your shooter area. Yeah, so we have these high speed rollers in the serializer, we call it. And those just kind of help funnel the balls up into the main body of the serializer and they'll just spin and to kick the balls up and then we have some tread up in here just to get some friction to help grab the balls. And then we have the wheels are all there to hold the balls in place. We have beam brake sensors to let us know when we have balls in there. Same with color sensors to reject the wrong color. And it's been, we have you know very few jams and it's worked fairly well for Pick, quick pickup and shooting. And we'll get into programming a little bit as well too, but can we see the, the uh, deployment of the uh, intake? And oh, can we grab a piece of cargo and just see that go in too? So okay, so that's our stance, your blue alliance, right? Yeah, so that was the auto rejection of the red ball. And then this would be the manual rejection of another color of another ball if we needed to. Yeah. And we'll talk a bit more about those sensors in a little bit. Let's go into your shooter here. Uh, talk to me about uh, concept and design for it. Now, uh, your team's sword drive, uh, no turret on things, right? Because your sword drive is going to do well for that. I'd uh, love to hear more about uh, just uh, your shooter, what's gone into it. And then, like, where does your team like to shoot from? What's kind of your sweet spot? So our shooter, it's had a few iterations. We mainly, the one thing that we changed from our first competition is that we ditched the linear servos that we were using to drive the hood and opted for a Johnson PLG motor, which is much faster and much more durable. Those servos just kept breaking. But we have this so that we can essentially shoot from anywhere on the field with the limelight able to control the hood angle, it can control the flywheel speed, and it'll aim the robot left and right. 
So we, the launch pad is nice sometimes for the protection, but we pretty much just shoot from wherever we get a clean shot and wherever will be the fastest. Uh, so you got a couple sets of wheels, right? So you got kind of this pre-shooter going in your flywheel in there. Can you just talk about uh, how that's been interacting with the cargo? Because you also have these rollers too. Yes, so we have a very final stage of what we call the serializer, which would be these gotcha. lower wheels. And those can keep the balls tucked up in there. We have them to just hold them in place. And then the shooter we have, originally we just had some like static rollers basically at the back, but we decided to go for the active rollers with the well, all the fair lane wheels there so that we can control the back, the backspin and just get more power and more consistency especially. Let's go next into your uh, climber here. Hunter's going to take over and uh, walk us through uh, the different aspects of it. As mentioned, you have a wickedly fast climber on your robot, but I'd love to hear about uh, what's gone into it. And then uh, I know we can do a demo. It might be a little slowed down than the real totally. one, but tell us more about it. So, so yeah, this is a, this, the, the name for this we have is the Ferris Wheel of Doom, um, mainly because it's so fast and looks a little bit scary, but the concept is pretty simple. Um, throughout the climber, you'll see we have a double hand side, as we call it, on yeah. this side over here, and then a single hand side. Um, so the sequence is pretty simple. We'll start with this upper pocket that does not have these large fangs, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, this is what we'll latch onto the mid bar. So we'll come into the side of the hanger, we'll uh, uh, move our climber to a vertical position, and the robot's LEDs turn yellow, and it begins watching these sensors. Um, the drive base slows down, and so as a driver, I'm able to back it in nice and easily to the bar. And the moment that it picks up the bar with these inductive sensors, the latches come closed and the LEDs turn green, letting the operator know we're ready to go up. Um, so at this point, um, we can start rotating the climber at full speed, each motor. There's two Falcons that drive it. Each of them draw about 55 amps. Um, this single hand hookup here will latch onto the high bar. Um, and there are also two more inductive sensors in each of those uh, each of those hands, so we know exactly when the bar is in there. Um, at that point, we'll unlatch here, um, and we'll wait about a quarter of a second, and we'll deploy the double hand side again. All of these are one solenoid. However, the bottom two cylinders here are regulated, which is, is important when we latch onto the traverse bar. Um, so at that point, we're on the high bar with our single hand hooks. Um, we're unlatched here, but they're out again, and we're swinging at full speed up to the traverse bar. Um, and so what happens is, because these are low pressure, they almost act as springs. Um, so the bar, uh, the traverse bar, actually gets slammed into this pocket here. Um, and these, these act as springs just like that, you can see it there. There's no active holding required. One of the problems we first had was we would have to hold the climber at a position to wait for the air to actually travel to the cylinder to deploy the latches. This way, there's no need to wait for that. We can just watch the sensor, and the moment that we see a bar, we know we're latched. Um, another thing you'll see back towards the single hand side are these linear slides back over here. Um, one of the first problems we had um, was a varying center to center distance uh, on the field, which can be plus or minus one half of an inch. Um, so what these are, are uh, two just linear slides built into here. Inside we have a half inch by one and a half inch steel box tube. And that allows this climber um, to handle a center to center of plus or minus 0.7. Um, and this is, this is critical um, depending on the field of how it's built. Any of these distances could be over or under. Um, and that comes into why we have these fangs over here. Um, as we drop off the mid bar, the weight of the robot pulls both of these slides to maximum length. Um, and what that means is we can expect the bar either uh, smack in the middle of these traverse pockets or an inch and a half almost in. Um, so the fangs can totally account for that and the, the, those adjust uh, once we latch onto the traverse bar automatically and we're on. Can we just see a, a quick kind of demo of what that looks like, and then yeah. we'll talk more about programming as we wrap yeah, up Yeah, I'm going to let Dino in to uh, demonstrate. So this is about like a ha half speed, essentially, right? What would you Much be? less. This climbs in sure. two and a half seconds. So we're going to go this oh, way. Okay. Yeah, this is our stow position. So um, this is what it will look like when you pull up to the mid bar, and you'll arm the climbing system, the arm switch. It all turns yellow. The latches retract. Um, we don't have a full steel bar to activate both sensors, but once that happens, these LEDs here would turn green and the latches would close. That tells you know, the operator, looks basically like that, that would tell him that we're ready to climb. Um, so at this point, all he would do is hold down the auto climb switch and it would take us all the way up to the top without yeah. him doing anything. For the purposes of demonstration, we're gonna have him jog through with the manual controls. Um, so first he's gonna um, activate the climb sequence, or if, as if he would, and we're gonna move the climber up this way, and right there we would latch onto the high bar. So we're now stuck mid and high. These latches here are gonna come undone, and then it's gonna move down a tiny bit, and then they're gonna come back out. 
I'm going to put the, those latches back out. And you can see these ones also takes, uh, take longer to come out because there's uh, much less pressure. And then we're just going to continue all the way up, all the way to, to the traverse bar, right about there. Um, so at this point, we're on the high bar and the traverse bar. Um, our first design concept was let's add a brake to the gearbox and go the other way. Um, we decided it's almost easier and more efficient to just drop off the bar. So we have a single hand release, which you can activate right here, just like that. As a little bit of uh, uh, backwards feed to help us um, get some time for these to actually retract. Um, and at, at this point here, we just cut the motors. Doesn't matter if the match is over, we're disabled. We're, we're on the traverse bar, we're off the high bar. It's 15 points right there. That's the whole climbing sequence for you. It, and it looks fantastic. It's been working great for your team as well, too. Thank Dino, you. let's wrap up on your robot. Talk about uh, sensors, programming, anything you'd like to uh, overview on this robot from that perspective. Um, well, the first major thing I'd like to talk, talk about is the uh, code we used for the shooter. Uh, we spent a good two days. Uh, instead of using an equation, we used a table. And so what we did was we put the robot one foot away from the, uh, the hub in increments. Sure and just kept on trying shots over and over again until it landed every single time. And we just did that for about two days until we got a full table of every single shooter hood and the speed that we needed for every distance away from it. And uh, one more major thing that is pretty unique is uh, we had a problem with can utilization on our robots. And so the solution to that was two of our motors actually run over PWM instead of can. Yep. So we have the intake and one of the serializer motors because neither of those need any particularly special control. You basically just run them 100% forward or 100% backwards. And so these are all wired directly to Rio, uh, just basically over power. Um, just a couple of last follow-ups on this. So uh, from your uh, your color uh, sensor that you've been using, we saw we saw the demo talked about a little bit earlier on there. Um, when you were uh, looking at it from a programming side, were there any complications to like uh, sensing those? Did you have to make any modifications to what the color sensor was outputting? Anything like that at all? Yeah, so one big issue that I imagine a lot of teams have was uh, the port that the color sensor uses, I2C, yep. is not optimized very well. So if you run it too many times a second, uh, your robot will actually start to slow down. The code itself will run too many times and will make everything else start to just run way slower than it needs to. So what we actually had to do was uh, we use the beam brake that's right here next to it. And so the color sensor is only running if the beam brake is active. So that way we're only running the color sensor, or the color sensor is only checking if there's a the right color ball in there if the beam brake senses that there's a ball right next to it. And then lastly on your uh, climber uh, that you have, at what point did you determine that you needed to do like an automated climb? Was that like an initial thought process or was it like, hey, we found out we're so quick that we need to do something automated? I uh, know that was a plan right from the start. We sure. wouldn't have as fast as a climb as we could get. And so we figured having to be able to do it autonomously would be the best way to do that. Well, 696 uh, Circuit Breakers, once again, phenomenal uh, robot we've seen here today. Uh, definitely the king of climb in California, I'll tell you that. But uh, looking to do even more things here at the World Championships. So good luck uh, as we go into uh, day number two of competition. And wish you the best here. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks to Stryker Careers for their support in this video. First, alumni and mentors are making Stryker a top priority for their internships and careers. That's because Stryker knows that those in first are the leaders and innovators of tomorrow. If you want to help make the world a better place by creating life-saving medical devices and technology, get started at careers.stryker.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.